can I just invite us, uh, whether we're at home or whether we're here in church, just to bow our heads and our hearts in God's presence. And as we bow in worship, it might seem feeble to us, but we are assured that God is pleased with our offering as we come to him with our lives, just as we are. And we come to worship in his presence and we are bathed in his love and in his spirit. And we're ready to receive from him, from his word, from his spirit, from the bread and the wine in our communion service today to be enriched, to be empowered, to be resourced for our own lives. Yes, Lord, but so that we can then go out and minister to others and serve others in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you can see there with our first slide, um, the title Life in the Spirit is not just for um, what we're looking at today, but actually will provide a theme for us um, for three months, actually, May, June, July, first Sunday of May today, and we'll be looking at this theme of Life in the Spirit. Um, by way of introduction, I just want to talk about a little bit and remind us of how we live the Christian life. We're called to be Christians, to be Christ-like, to be godly. How do you do it? Well, um, I think one of our um, mistakes and one of our go-to default modes when we get stuck um, is to try our best. Is there anything wrong with trying your best? I'm not really sure, but, you know, try your best. Um, people talk about straining to follow the example of Jesus. Um, and we can live by a moral code and we can have do's and don'ts and things that kind of make up what we would call a religious system. That's how religious systems and, uh, and so on have, have come into being. Now, some of these things are laudable in and of themselves. There's nothing kind of necessarily evil or bad about anything I've just mentioned. But to live a Christian life actually um, doesn't include or involve any of those things. It's rather to do with trusting Jesus. It's to do with living a life of faith and obedience. And it's to do with dependence on the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is a spiritual life. It's a godly life. It's of God. It's a supernatural life, therefore. And we can only live it when we are relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. It's all to do with living in the Spirit. So at the last Passover meal, Jesus said, or one of the things that he said was, it's good for you that I'm going away. Hang on, <laughs> we want you around. But Jesus said, it's good that I'm going away so that I can send the Holy Spirit to you. So in other words, he was saying the Holy Spirit will be a greater blessing with you and in you and for you than if I was to remain. That's food for thought. On the first Easter Sunday, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said a few things to them. First of all, he said, peace be with you, he said it twice. So he, he, he addresses our emotional state, our fear, our anxieties and grants us peace. And then he says, this is the job I've got for you to do. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So you think, how do we do that? How do we receive peace? How do we do your work, Jesus? 
Jesus then breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that was in, in anticipation of the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost had not yet arrived. Again, underline the importance of life in the Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit working in us and through us and life in the Spirit. Let's go back to the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, one of the things that he said was, I baptize you with water, but he, the Messiah, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So as I say, over the next three months, we will be exploring this life in the Spirit, God working in us and God working through us. Let's turn to our first reading, Acts chapter 8. This is our lectionary reading, and from it I want to just take out what it might look like to live a spirit-filled lifestyle. Now, this is a very specific story about a very specific person and time in history. It happened. But from it, we can learn about how God wants to work in us and work through us. So let's just pick out some bullet points. Um, in a spirit-filled lifestyle, we may have angelic encounters. Have you ever had an angelic encounter? Um, you may be conscious of the fact you've had an angelic encounter. I, I'm not conscious of the fact, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised that when I find out when I'm in heaven that uh, some of the encounters I've had have been angelic. You know, when you meet that person and they just kind of, where did he come from, she come from? And they just say the right word or point you in the right direction. I'm sure that in our experiences, some of those encounters have been angelic encounters. Living a spirit-filled life, I think, involves specific guidance. Um, we'll talk about this in one of the Sundays, you know, how, how are we guided by the Holy Spirit? But one of the ways, not always, but one of the ways that God guides us through the Holy Spirit is specific guidance. Go to this specific junction, Philip, on the desert road, blah, blah, blah. And you turn right here and you turn left there and you'll find the, the door third on your right, the one with the red curtains on the outside. Have you ever had experiences like that or heard people who've had experiences like that? Um, and this is the experience that Philip had. He had specific guidance. A spirit-filled lifestyle involves divine encounters, a, a God incident. When we meet somebody, sometimes that we weren't even planning to meet. I'm not sure that Philip, it says while he was on his way, he saw this Ethiopian eunuch. It wasn't in his diary. It wasn't on his to-do list. It was one of those wonderful divine interruptions in his life that sometimes, sometimes we get, and God takes us off our track for the day so that we can get on his track for that moment in time. And we have divine encounters when we meet the right person at the right place at the right time. Have you ever had any of those experiences? That's God leading you in the power of his spirit. To be a person filled with the spirit also means joining in with what the Holy Spirit is already doing. Philip didn't go up to the Ethiopian eunuch and said, you know what, I think it'd be a good idea if you read Isaiah. <laughs> you know, that, that's our program from church for this three months that so you, you read through the book of Isaiah. It'd be a good idea if you read it. It was already reading it. God was already at work. And God was saying to Philip, I just want you to join in with what I'm doing. You're part of the team now. We are part of that divine team. His mission is our mission. And as we work, God works. Because Jesus going away and sending the Holy Spirit is just Jesus being everywhere at once through you and me. Isn't it wonderful? That's why he said, it's best if I go away. I can do more through you than if I were to stay and do it through myself. Because the Holy, Holy Spirit that's in me is going to be in you, and I can do everything 
that I need to do uh, times a billion or whatever. And that's what God was saying to Philip, just join in with what I'm doing. And being filled with the Spirit means explaining to others what God is doing in that person's life. Oh, so you've had that experience, have you? Let me just explain to you what's going on. Oh, you've had this dream, have you? Or you've met this person, or you've read something, or you've seen something on the TV and it's spoken to you, or you're praying, or whatever it might be. What we do as God's people is bring to bear on that person God's viewpoint. We shed God's light on what is happening in that person's life so that there's understanding, there's explanation as to what's going on. I would also say at this point that living a life in the spirit is, is something that has to work hand in hand with the scriptures. Um, and, and I say this because uh, it's ever so easy to flirt off and say, I just want to live in the spirit. I just want all the glory uh, of, of living in the spirit. I just want the excitement, the glamour, that charismatic lifestyle where I'm not bound by any rules and regulations, all that religious stuff. I get that, and we get that, but that does not mean that it's a lifestyle that's devoid from the scriptures. The word of God and the spirit of God work together. And whenever those two elements, if we want to call them that, flirt apart, we're in big trouble. Some people just concentrate on the word of God and they dry up. Some people just concentrate on the Spirit of God and they blow up. <laughs> what we need to do is to grow up. To grow up, we need the Word of God and we need the Spirit of God. So as the Spirit of God was working, note the uh, importance of the Scriptures. He was reading what we call Isaiah chapter 53. There's no chapters and verses in those days. It's just a scroll. But we know, know it as Isaiah chapter 53. So the Spirit of God was working hand in hand with the Word of God. That's really important too. Being filled with the Spirit means also sharing the good news of Jesus. Because that's what he did. He explained from Isaiah 53 the life, the ministry, the work, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Being filled with the Spirit and living a Spirit-filled lifestyle means building the church of Jesus Christ. Um, that might mean building up the Methodist Church or the Baptist Church or the Anglican Church. It might mean all of those things. But please let's remember that the church is bigger than our denomination. We can get so narrow-minded and say we've got to get the Anglican Church right and we've got to sort things out. Yes, we have. But the kingdom of God, the church of Jesus Christ, is bigger than us, bigger than any human denomination. And once the penny begins to drop there, then we'll be in a much better place in terms of living a spirit-filled lifestyle. And we're talking about building the church of Jesus Christ, building God's temple. This eunuch was baptized. He was incorporated into the body of Christ. Living a spiritual lifestyle, being filled with the Spirit and being guided by the Spirit means having significant, significant outcomes. It means that we don't waste our time going down rabbit trails. And uh, we do that. It's a lot of what we do sometimes, let's be honest, is trial and error. And we shouldn't beat ourselves up about that. Um, because sometimes life is like that. But when we're in that spiritually sweet place of communion with God, of trusting, of, of obeying, and of depending on the Holy Spirit, we come out with significant outcomes. And that meeting that we have with that person has amazing consequences. So this eunuch went to Africa and basically went back to his uh, home in Africa and basically founded the church in Africa is what happened 
All because Philip was spirit-filled, he was obedient, he had faith, and he worked hand in hand with God. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful that when we meet people and do things, it's so meaningful, it's so significant that there are outcomes. Now, lots of those outcomes we will not know about until we're in heaven. Okay, so it's not a matter of getting your spreadsheet out and saying, well, we did that, that wasn't very successful, and we did that, that was successful. I'm not saying we shouldn't review, of course we should, but we should trust God the Holy Spirit to the point where we say, Lord, even though sometimes we don't see outcomes, we trust you that there will be outcomes. And that helps us to remain faithful in everything that we do, even though sometimes we don't see those outcomes. We should always do the right thing, trusting God to bless. So again, as we explore this theme, we'll be looking at what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And how, again, going back to Philip, we can live in that supernatural um, dimension. He was taken from where he was and transported somewhere else. A bit like, was it Elijah in the Old Testament had a similar experience? So I'm not saying, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we can go from here to a beach in the Bahamas just without, without the aid of airplanes or anything like that. Uh, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that as we are filled with the Spirit, we can experience supernatural dimensions in our life, miraculous workings that maybe we're not looking for at the moment, or we, we just don't think that they will be part of our lives. Maybe not as dramatic as Philip, but who knows? Why should we put limits and say, well, you know, okay, that was, uh, that was early church, that was a book of Acts, that was a bit special, um, we're down the road, so it doesn't, doesn't apply to us. Maybe as part of what we're looking at as we go through this stuff, that mentality will change and will become more expectant as to what God wants to do in us and through us. So we don't set those ceilings to our expectations. We begin to expect more from God. Let's look at our second reading, which you might think, what on earth has it got to do with the first reading? What's Chronicles got to do with um, life in the spirit and uh, what we've just looked at with Philip? The reason uh, I feel that this is important for us right at the beginning of our theme is because it helps us to set a basic foundation. Now, this is a, for many of us, a familiar part of the scriptures. Um, many of us were uh, involved in the 27, 27 prayer program from 2001 to 2008, seven years. It was a prayer movement in the city um, that blessed the church in the city and not just the church in the city, blessed the city. And certainly in terms of um, St. Paul's and the way it helped us, it helped us tremendously. Uh, I know personally in 2001, I perhaps wasn't in as good a place as I needed to be. And in 2008, I was a vicar at St. Paul's. Maybe, for me personally, for us here at St. Paul's, that movement was a significant prayer movement. There are countless stories as we, and then as we look back, we can see the effects of that prayer movement to this day in lots of different ways beyond my own personal experience, beyond the experience of St. Paul's. But during that um, time, 2C7, two, two, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, was the key verse. If you were part of the call to prayer um, the other night, um, I think it was uh, the sixth call to prayer, uh, Rob Manford um, took time just to take us back actually and uh, do, a, do, a, do a bit of a summary, just remind us of, uh, of that verse and some of the key themes and, and, and so on uh, of that period of time. And um, I just want to 
just to close by looking at that again for us. Before we do, let's just get the context of what was happening at this period of history in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Don't panic, I'm not going to go into great detail, <laughs> a lot of historical data. But King David had just died. He was succeeded by his son, Solomon. David had done all the preparation work for what he had wished would have been his project. That is to build a temple, a dwelling place, a home for the Lord. And when we read through the Psalms and we read through um, the history of David in the scriptures, we see that that was the heartbeat, that was the prayer, that was his mission uh, to, to build the temple. But it was Solomon's job in the end to build the temple, not David's. And in chapter 7 of um, 2 Chronicles, we can see the dedication of the temple. There was fire, there was glory. We could perhaps uh, make a note of this when we look at the day of Pentecost again, because there's an interesting parallel between the dedication of the temple here and the dedication and the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost, because we are now the temple, are we not? And we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. There were sacrifices offered. There was worship. There was consecration. There was 14 days of festivities. Talk about spring harvest times a thousand. This was a spring harvest, a Christian festival or spiritual festival to end, to end them all. 14 days of um, spiritual celebration and rejoicing at the fact that they'd arrived at the point of having built the temple. When they get to the end of it, God speaks to Solomon. And this is when we get to verse 14. And God says to Solomon, let's just go through it again. If my people, that was the nation of Israel then, and today it's us, it's God's new Israel, new Jerusalem, that's us, the Church of Jesus Christ. So if my people who are called by my name, we're called by the name of Jesus, aren't we? We are Christians. Jesus Christ, Christians. We are, he was the Messiah. We are little messiahs, little Jesuses, because we're filled with his spirit and we represent him wherever we go. If we do three things, as uh, Robert was reminding us the other night, if we humble ourselves, if we come to the point where we realize we're not the bee's knees, that although we are Christians, although we are on his team, although we're called to do his work, we depend on his Holy Spirit. If we do the second thing, which is to pray and seek his face. In other words, not go it alone. Know that we need to come to him every day, every moment of every day. And if we do the third thing, turn from our wicked ways. You might say, well, we're not wicked. Well, we might not be murderers and we might not be whatever, you know, we might define as wicked. But in God's eyes, if we get back to that expectancy thing, if we are not expecting from God what we should be expecting from God, that's a form of wickedness. If we're not believing like we should believe, that's unbelief. I think God classes that as wickedness. We've got to redefine by what we mean by wickedness. If we're going it alone and trying our best and living by a moral code and not depending on his spirit, I think that God would define that as wickedness. Yeah, so we have to redefine what we mean by evil and what we mean by wickedness. So if we turn from all those things, then God will do, in his turn, will do three things as well. He will hear us from heaven. He will forgive our sin. And he will heal the land. And the call to repentance is for us, the people of God, 
but also we have a responsibility on behalf of as a parish church we have a responsibility on behalf of the parish so we repent on behalf of the parish the church then needs to repent on behalf of the city all the churches together and all the churches together nationwide need to repent on behalf of the nation and the church world worldwide needs to repent on behalf of the world and especially as we are coming out of the pandemic and we see the effect of what's been going on i believe that's a call to repentance by saying that i'm not saying it's anybody's fault or that we've sinned and therefore god has punished i don't want to go down that road at all but we do have to admit that we've not treated the world the way that we should treat it we are propelled by greed we are propelled by shortcuts we are propelled by the strongest treading on the weakest when we think about third world countries we are propelled by if i say uh, racism and bullying anybody that's different from us and and and, and we feel that are inferior to us through whatever uh, filter you want to use whether it's color whether it's race whether it's sex whether it's the way we dress whether remember when you're at school if you wore glasses you were specky four eyes you know whatever it is that makes you different those things have contributed to why we are where we are so therefore we need to repent and uh, do you know what when we try to put the world to right and we have conversations and we say you know boris johnson should do this president biden should do that um the Chinese leader should do this, and so on and so forth. That's all well and good. But this kind of repentance, you know where it starts? It starts with me. What am I doing? What's my lifestyle like? It starts with us. What are we doing? What's our lifestyle like? And we've been, I think through the pandemic, talking about resetting and restarting and learning and what do we stop doing what do we start doing and in my mind it's not so much to do with programs and the way we do church as much as it's to do with our own attitudes and the way that we live our lives and folks it starts with me because if it doesn't start there it doesn't start anywhere and part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. Jesus said that in John's Gospel. Now, when the light of God shines on us through the Holy Spirit, it's not a light that condemns us. But it's a light that says, turn to Jesus. This bit isn't good. It's dark. God's light is shining on it. Let's come for cleansing. The Holy Spirit will always direct us to Jesus. And there's always forgiveness. What's that verse that we've been looking at a little bit in recent days? We are invited to come into the throne of grace to find grace and mercy and help in time of need. Now is that time of need. Now is the time for us to come and to clear the decks. To say, Lord, here am I. Here we are. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on the world. Pause. So that's my prayer. That's my uh, starter for 10 on this theme of life in the Spirit. It's going to be great looking at the Holy Spirit and what he does in us and through us. But unless we get this foundation right, we're not going to go very far. We know that in our own lives individually. We know that as a church. We really need to get radical. And that means getting, getting to the roots of the matter. Let the Holy Spirit work in our lives at that deep level. So that we can then come to 
Philip in Acts chapter 8 <laughs> and get to the heights of where he was. But he only got there because of the principles that we're talking about here of uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Amen.